United's like, okay, look, we're going to decrease our prior authorizations by 23%. We're going to go from 13 million to 10 a year. We, we at United, we realize the burden that this is for, uh, for um, doctor's offices. And we realize that this non-payment through prior authorizations is, is financially constricting the cash flow of the doctors and hospitals. Okay, that's fine. That's a 23% decrease in the number of prior authorizations. That does not mean it is a 23% decrease in the amount of money that requires prior authorization. That is not 23% of the total claims spend that goes through the prior authorization. And that is because of what is referred to as the Pareto principle. Now, this is the number one most important slide that I'm going to go over today because everybody who works in healthcare finance has to have a detailed understanding of the Pareto principle. In my opinion, it is healthcare finance malpractice if you do not understand the Pareto principle. So I am going to blow this slide up even more. So it is the 80-20 rule, meaning that you have a chart here where you have the, let's just say on the x-axis, this is the number of prior authorizations and they are broken down into five tranches of 20% each. So 20% of the prior authorizations, another 20% of the prior authorizations, another, another, another. There's five tranches. So this adds up to 100% of the prior authorizations. Now, here you have the amount of money per prior authorizations because some prior authorizations are for procedures that only cost 20, you know, $250. And other procedure, other prior authorizations are for procedures that cost $250,000. And the point in the 80-20 rule is that 80% of the claim spend or the reimbursement that requires prior authorization is in only 20% of the actual prior authorizations. And that is referred to as the Pareto principle. Pareto was a uh, an Italian economist way um, back, almost in the Middle Ages. It might have been the 17 or the 1800s. Okay, now um, it stratifies even more. Within that 20%, the top 4% of prior authorizations are actually responsible for 50% of the money that flows through prior authorizations. Now notice the next 20% is only 12% of the dollars. The next 20% is only 5% of the dollars. The next 20% is only 2% of the dollars. And then the bottom 20% is only 1% of the dollars. That means that potentially if United decreased their prior authorization count by 20%, they will have only decreased the amount of money impacted by that decrease in prior authorizations by barely more than 1%. So now, is United going to choose this 20%? Is 80% of the money that flows through prior authorization going to be impacted by their change? Probably not. It's probably going to be closer to this end of the money, okay? This same Pareto principle applies to plan members and costs. The top 20% of plan members drive 80% of the cost for the plan. The top 4% of plan members drive 50% of the costs for the plan. Notice the bottom 20% of plan members only drive 1% of the spend. In other words, the bottom 40% only drive 3% of the spend. Okay. The bottom 60% of a plan population only drives 8% of the total spend. So when you talk about, quote unquote, the engaging the population, it's important. It's super important to know that it's what part of the population are you engaging? Because if you're engaging the bottom 60% of your plan members, then you will have almost zero impact on the plan's cost because that bottom 60% don't generate any claims. 
So it's not just the quantity of engagement that is important. It is the quality of the engagement. In other words, who are you engaging? That is super important. Okay. Pareto principle. Okay. It's going to be on a test next week. Get ready. Okay. Now, so fine. What are these prior authorizations that have very high dollar amounts associated with them? Okay. One, they are orthopedic surgery and neuro neurosurgeries, i.e. joint replacements like hip and knee replacements, and then spine surgeries for the lumbar spine and the cervical spine, and then scoliosis surgeries. These are surgeries that cost upwards of 50000 to over $200,000, close to a quarter million dollars for a complex scoliosis surgery. It's for transplant. By far the most common transplant is kidney transplants. Kidney transplants blow heart, liver, and pancreas uh, transplants and lung transplants out of the water, okay? So just know when you talk about transplants, the vast majority of those transplants are kidney transplants, which also cost over a quarter million dollars. Next is oncology. So for breast cancer and colon cancer and prostate cancer and lung cancer, those are the big cancers for a health plan, okay? For the surgery, for the chemo, and for the radiation, all of these require prior authorization, okay? Remember that oncology is one of the top three diagnostic categories. So, on, so orthopedics, oncology, and also then cardiac is the, is the other one. So for pacemakers, ICD, which is an implantable cardiac defibrillator, it's given to people who have um, uh, co uh, congestive heart failure with uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, and then uh, it's also uh, for stress tests and then for echocardiograms all require uh, prior authorization. So, okay. So in other words, there's gobs and gobs of prior authorizations that are required for other types of services, but they're for much lower dollar amounts, the much high, the very high dollar amount areas of prior authorization are in these clinical areas. This is where the money is. Okay. Why are denials and prior authorizations so important to a health insurance company? If doctors and hospitals hate prior authorizations so much and it costs them upwards of 16 to 25 percent of their revenue to actually do the prior authors to actually fight the denials and the prior authorizations to actually get paid then why in the world during negotiations don't the doctors and hospitals negotiate out the denial and prior authorization process. Be like, look, you do um, you negotiate surgeries. Like, let's just not do prior authorizations. That could be part of the negotiation process. But obviously, denials and prior authorizations are kept in the contracts because they are so. The hospital's like, okay, fine. If you're going to put denials and prior authorizations in the contract then you're going to have to pay me much more per coronary artery bypass graft. You're going to have to pay me much more per spine surgery. Like the hospital could be like, okay, instead of me paying me a, a quarter of a million dollars for a scoliosis surgery, then you only have to pay me $150,000, but you got to get rid of the prior authorization. But the, the insurance company doesn't want to do that, right? Why? Because the denials and the prior authorizations are a very important thermostat to tightly control the medical loss ratio. So remember, the Affordable Care Act said that insurance companies must spend 80 to 85% of all of their premium on claims themselves, and they can then retain 15 to 20%. That 80 to 85% is the medical loss ratio, okay? So you better believe the health insurance company keep very close tabs on the claims that are being paid out. And they want that medical loss ratio to be as close to the 80 to 85% as humanly possible and not 87%, not 88%, not 90%, not 92%. Every quarter, for public, especially for publicly traded health insurance companies, they report their um, medical loss ratio. And the Wall Street analysts look at that number with supreme importance. And if that medical loss ratio number is too high, the stock price is going to get hammered, okay? So in order to have super tight control, because if you are a CFO at a health insurance company, 
then you need to make the numbers work. And by golly, you will make the numbers work. And you will make the numbers work by if you need to adjust up or adjust down denials and authorizations in order to make those numbers work, you will. Here are the medical loss ratios for United going back to Q3 2021, 83%. Q4 2021, 83.7%. Look at that. Only 0.7% different. Q1 2022, the next quarter, 82%. Next quarter, 81.5%. 80, next quarter, 81.6%. Next quarter, 82.8%. Next quarter, 82.2%. They are completely consistent, remarkably, because they use denials and prior authorizations to fine tune the claim payments that are going out the door. Okay. Okay. There is absolutely variability in medical care and claims coming in. The fourth quarter is always higher because that's when people have met their deductibles. And so more claims are submitted. You would expect more claims to be paid out in either the fourth quarter or in the first quarter of the subsequent year. You don't see a change in the medical loss ratio quarter by quarter because while there are changes in the size and, you know, but people are getting all their surgeries in the fourth quarter, the health insurance companies are intentionally adjusting their payment to smooth out the medical loss ratio through denials and prior authorizations, okay? Next up, what happened in Q3 and Q4 of 2021? COVID was still raging, okay? Remember that? COVID didn't start going away until the first quarter of 2022. During COVID, paradoxically, the number of elective surgeries, joint replacements, knee replacements, the amount of cancer surgeries, the amount of cancer treatments, they all went down because the hospitals didn't have the staff and the capacity or they, for infection control purposes, they could not perform these types of procedures. So in other words, you would expect the medical loss ratio in Q3 and Q4 of 21 and in Q1 uh, uh, of 22 to be lower but then as COVID lightened up and then as the knee replacements and the hip replacements and the spine surgeries and the cancer surgeries, as they came back, you would expect the medical loss ratio to go up because more doctors and hospitals were filing, filing, filing more claims to make up for the lack of care that was provided during COVID. Notice what happened to the medical loss ratio. It didn't go up. It didn't go up 82%, 81%, 81%, 82%. It stayed remarkably flat. Why? Because the insurance carriers have the thermostat of denials and prior authorizations to connect, to tightly control, regardless of how many claims are coming in, they can tightly go out through denials and prior authorizations. Okay. Now, now this has significant implications for patients. Okay. When any patient goes to the doctor or the hospital, they sign a form that says that the patient is ultimately financially responsible for care, okay? The, the doctor or the hospital will bill the insurance company, but if the insurance doesn't pay, then the ultimate financial responsibility lies with the patient, okay? Medical policy and denials essentially equals non-insurance coverage. It shouldn't be called medical policy. Okay, medical policy is a completely deceptive term that should not allowed to be used. This this is non coverage. There should be a bright red letters, a non coverage document that outlines the eighty pages of non coverage that you had. To call it medical policy is intentionally deceptive. Okay, next up. Prior authorization, again, equals delayed or no insurance, okay? So people don't have insurance. They kind of have insurance, okay? Insurance is the transference of risk, okay? You, when you have medical insurance, you kind of have the transference of risk. You have 80 pages of non-transference of risk, 